Welcome back to another Lumix Live, everybody. How are you all doing? Uh, we've got a, a, a bit of a, a more technical, involved conversation uh, planned for today. Uh, as the title says, we're going to be talking about the autofocusing systems on Lumix cameras and uh, really kind of do a deep dive on how the system works, give explanations about the various different modes and settings that you have at your disposal, and then walk through also some of the customization that you can have with uh, the, between photography and videography in the, the cameras themselves. So I've got my, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have my S5 Mark II X hooked up here, and uh, yeah, we're gonna kind of just go through this, uh, walk through the menus, address questions that any of you may have, and uh, yeah, just kind of go from there. So if you have questions uh, that you wanna ask, whether it's autofocus related, system related, or um, even if it's any other topic, uh, just tag at Lumix USA in the chat. So just start typing Lumix USA and make sure that the uh, at symbol goes on there. Uh, and then I'll be able to see it on my side and hopefully be able to get to as many of the questions as, as we can. Um, with that, uh, if this is the first time you're joining us, these are the weekly broadcasts that we do every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time uh, in order to basically just allow you to have an access to Lumix, to, to all of us here. Uh, we'll, we always try to address as many questions as we can and really just have these programs built off the things that you've all been asking us for, um, you know, to, to get questions answered in. So um, I encourage all of you to uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you want. We will, like I said, I will try to get to as many of them as I possibly can. Um, today we are focusing on the autofocus and we will be going through this, but I will be watching and trying to get to um, some of the other stuff as quickly as I can as well. Um, before we jump too far into that, I want to remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services. Uh, here in the United States, we have Red and Platinum. Red is free. If you have purchased a uh, Lumix camera recently, uh, get yourself uh, registered on the Red tier. It is free. You can either follow the QR code on screen or the link down in the description. Uh, and if you're someone who wants to have like the next level of service and support, uh, you can always take a look at the Platinum level. That is a paid level membership. Uh, but that gets you things like two-day repairs with free next-day shipping both ways, 20% out of 20% off out of warranty uh, repairs, so things like a drop, a break, things, you know, stuff like that, or if the camera's just older than the three years. Uh, but you also get things like an exclusive member hotline, so if you want to speak to somebody instead of going through uh, chat or email, you have access to that, and you also get the annual sensor cleanings, EVFs, uh, cleanings, and lens calibrations and firmware stuff. So pretty, pretty sick package overall. If it's something you're interested in, you can follow the links down in the description or the QR code on the screen, and it'll bring you right to the page. Uh, this is an inclusive program for micro four thirds and for full frame cameras. So if you've got a camera, just double check the uh, list that we have posted under eligibility, and you can make sure that your equipment is uh, within the spec of what you need to be on the program. So... <clears throat> Let's see here. I want to jump through. I see a lot of questions and comments and all that kind of stuff running through. So like always, let's uh, let's dig through some of this here. So Ed says, I, on the S5 II, is it possible to customize the functions of the top and back dial from aperture and shutter speed, um, F and shutter speed, to something else? If yes, how? Um, there is some customization, and we will go through that in a little bit. Um, so stick with us and we'll, we'll definitely, once I go into the camera, we'll, we'll walk through that kind of stuff here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, other questions with tags here. D creative. Is there any way to retrieve an MDT file created on an S5 using a Mac? Um, so not on Mac OS per, like itself, you would need to run something like Parallels or any of the other window emulate Windows uh, environments for it, for the uh, MDT software that we have, the repair software. Um, there are other programs out there that you can buy, um, but because we do offer one for free, um, I, would, I would try to see if maybe you got a friend that's got a Windows computer and you can download the software and, and run it that way. Um, or check on the community. The community has been a huge help for those that are on Mac. Unfortunately, the software is Windows-based only, so 
that I know causes problems for some people, but at this point, I don't know if and when we would ever have a Mac version of the um, uh, Lumix Repair software. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where it's at right now. So, um, Gitfo says, uh, will we be looking at GH6 DFDAF or just the S5 Mark II phase hybrid autofocus today? We will actually be talking about both today. Um, so yeah, we're definitely going to go through, I'm using the, the S5 Mark II for the demonstration because the menu system is the same as the GH6. The underlying technologies are what are different between them. So everything that we talk about here is equally applicable to the GH6. So, um, definitely, you know, going to get some stuff out of that there too. So, uh, Maverick says, is there a way to record the time code on track three or four and use one and two for sound? Uh, unfortunately, no, at this point, there's not a way to split out the, uh, time code. Um, onto that kind of stuff. If you're using audio for time code, it's going to be running straight in the one, uh, whichever channel you've got it set up for. Um, you could force, um, on to channel three and four if you were using like the xlr one audio adapter and filling audio channels one and two with the xlr and then three and four as your the 3.5 in um that's one way you could do it but you would have to have audio on channels one and two for it to push to channel three or four um telling says how does the gh6 timecode work through the sync port does the camera read timecode from a generator continuously, or is it like the GH5S where it only reads one time when you plug it in? Um, the GH6, because you have that timecode port in there, um, you can jam sync your timecode into the camera. Um, it won't run off that timecode, so it, you'll have to either... You, you can keep it attached all the time, um, but I have to just double check. I believe you have to import... Uh, time code every once in a while if you're uh, if that's how you're working with the camera um, I believe the box cameras were the ones that can run directly off Genlock and time code um, to sync them across everything but uh, I know that you can link multiple GH cameras uh, over uh, GH sixes over time code to each other and they'll pull from each other for that Um so yeah, I, I'm not the most experienced working with timecode because truthfully software has gotten so good at matching things that a clap sync is more than enough to sync up multiple frames. Not for everybody, but for a lot of the stuff that I do and a lot of the stuff that many users do. So um, I will, when, when I know that we're going to be able to have Matt Fraser back on, um, that'll definitely be one of the topics we'll talk about is time code and gen lock and stuff like that and how it varies across all the different cameras. Um, let's see here. Ed says, are there any cameras with time code capabilities on the roadmap to get phase uh, autofocus upgrades? Uh, unfortunately, we don't talk about um, any of the potential future cameras or things like that or what, what could or will or won't be in future products. Um, it's just kind of, uh, uh, par for the course when you work for a company, there are things that I can talk about, things I can't talk about and future products is one of those things I can't talk about. So, um, any word on being able to deactivate third and fourth channel on your audio, if you're not using it at this point, there isn't going to be a change on that system. Um, I don't know if, and when, uh, there would potentially be a change to that. Uh, so for the time being, it is. It's, it's going to record all four, ch all four channels for you. Uh, when you do your imports into various different programs, you can have various different ways to have it remove the other two channels, depending on the software you're using. Um, so that's just kind of how the system's designed to work at this point. Uh, D says, thanks for doing these streams. Well, you're welcome. I'm happy that uh, uh, people are joining in and having all kinds of good questions here. Shed says, we know that S5-2 has great AF. What about the lock AF on human subjects? When in when that when that is in a group and we want to keep it locked on, uh, what is the best set? Uh, yeah, we are going to talk a little bit about that because there is a difference in the way the S5 did full area tracking and human detection versus the way the Mark II and the Mark II X do it. So I... I will cover some of the ways that, that I use the system to avoid problems of the system switching and thinking that without your input of like what you want to be focusing on, 
there are things that I can show you on how to, you know, kind of tweak that a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the battery on my S52X drains while not being used. Is there a setting cause with this? Uh, if not used for a week, the battery will be dead, and I have to charge it before a planned photo shoot. Uh, that seems not right with the camera. Um, my S52X with a battery in it, I can leave the thing for a month, and because I've got obviously I work for the company, so I've got multiples of some of these cameras. Um, I've had S52X sitting on my, my desk here with a battery in it that's been there for like a month and a half without using it, and it's lost a bar of battery, uh, in that time. Um, the, the, uh, couple things you can check, um, obviously if it's a, if it's a major concern, you could always check in with the service department, see, um, you know, there seems to be excessive battery drain. The other thing that you can always check is... Um, if you've ever enabled Bluetooth, if you've got the camera set up, um, like we talked about last week with the app controls, if you set the camera for wake over Bluetooth, um, that's going to run the battery because it's going to keep the system basically in a lighter sleep mode. Uh, but the S5 Mark II and the S5 Mark II have been designed to, um, go into a much lower power state when they're powered off in order to conserve battery for longer storage time. Um, this is one of the things that people have asked us a lot about as to why does the initial boot take a little bit longer than subsequent boots after that. So I would maybe just take a look at a couple of different settings. Worst case, um, save your camera settings out to an SD card or to the app, whichever one you want to do. Do a factory reset and then see because it could just be a setting that you've got set up um, on the camera. Um, let's see here. Uh, all right. Looks pretty good as far as the questions there. Remember if you have questions, tag at Lumix USA with your questions so I can see it. If I have to start taking a little bit of a stance that if your question doesn't have an at Lumix USA in it or at the beginning of it, I can't necessarily get to it because there's a lot of questions that are coming through. So just remember to do that and I'll try to get to your question. Um, I will come back to doing more questions after we start with this demo. So um, yeah, let's let's talk about autofocus settings here. So right now we're looking at my um, S5 Mark II X here and I've got my camera set up in just standard continuous focus. So there's a number of things that that kind of come into play with the various different, you know, kind of settings that you want to work with in the autofocusing system. So I'm going to start this at kind of like the top level, right? So with the autofocusing system, when you press the rear uh, dial on the camera, which actually I can do with my S5 Mark II. So if we take the back of the camera here, this button right here, this is your autofocus selector. So this is the button or the dial that has your AF, uh, your autofocus continuous, single and manual focus. And then in the middle, you have a button here to select your various different, um, you know, kind of autofocus modes. So that's what we're going to be looking at first. So as I have the setup here, I went right into that menu and you'll see a couple of various different choices here. You'll have, depending on, on what mode you have the camera in, you'll have things like one area, one area, excuse me, one area plus, zone, full area, tracking, and then because I'm in video mode, there are two options here that are grayed out. Uh, when you put the camera into the photo mode, which we'll do here, and I go back into here, you'll see that the custom zone option so vertical and horizontal has been changed so now that is a visible one but the pinpoint autofocus is still disabled to get to that one you have to change it to single focus when you change it to single focus then you can get your pinpoint autofocus so to start with that's how you can enable all of the various different af modes that are available on the camera uh, so that you can pick the base mode that you want to work in so let's put this back into video and from here, let's, let's talk about, you know, kind of what, what you see on this display, right? So AF modes, these are the kind of defining options for you to say, where do you want the autofocusing system to look? 
Um, think of these as the, the way I describe them to most people is think of these as backups for subject detections. Since subject detection has become the kind of primary that a lot of people rely on when it comes to autofocusing systems, you can either let the system just have the entire full area to just pick a subject from, which is actually meaning that you are giving it less input, or you can have the thing set up so that it, it will use the subject detections in the areas where you want it to go from, uh, or where you want it to focus on. So if we start all the way out on the end here, this is the, the tracking mode. So this is the, the traditional, you want it to visually track a subject that's not part of a detection mode. That's the, the tracking system here. Now, where this differs from cameras like the S5, the S1, S1R, S1H, even all the way back to the GH5S, the G9, the GH5 Mark II, these cameras can allow subject detection in any of these AF modes. Earlier cameras, if you're coming from any of the older cameras, you'll notice that subject detection is typically limited to its own function mode. Um, this is where some of that difference is with multiple people tracking, where this camera can use it in any area. The older cameras had their own dedicated mode and their own dedicated way of doing human detection. So if I were to be doing, say, like motorcycle photography, I could be using the, like the standard old school tracking mode with subject detection turned on so that if I have this mode selected, you'll get the box where you can position your focus to go but any subject detec detection algorithms that I want to use will only engage when a recognized subject comes into that box. So basically, if like a face touches that box, subject detection is going to enable if you have human face and eye detection turned on. If you've just got face and eye detection, it will only show up when there is a face and eye in that frame. If it goes down to, say, like the chest, then it's just going to be the tracking mode that you've defaulted it in. So why this is important to know is that if I were to just use full area, which is what I think a lot of people have been commonly using in various other systems, if I were to just use full area, I am not telling the camera any region of interest, any priority of a subject that I want to give. It is just looking at the entire range and it's focusing on what it thinks, not really thinks, what it is programmed to do, which could either be focus on the highest contrast scene, focus on the first uh, in-phase uh, PDAF point, uh, or when a subject comes into frame, use the subject detection that you have enabled, whether that's face and eye, human, uh, animal detection, you know, whatever option you've got set up. So in reality, in the full area mode, you have the least amount of control over what subject your camera is going to be focusing on. So to that question that was posed earlier about, hey, you know, there is a group scene where you've got multiple people, what mode would you recommend for this? Because this is where it's different than the original S5. This is where utilizing these AF modes is gonna be way more useful and gonna produce much better results for you. You have the option to do things like zone, one area, or one area plus. So if I'm going to approach a scene where I've got multiple people in frame, but I know that I really only care about one or two of them, say it's like I'm photographing a wedding and I want to make sure that the the couple are the ones that are going to be chosen for focus, I'm going to be using one area plus for that. Because when I select one area plus, I can now move my focus point where I want it to like for framing because I know like, hey, I want to have the the couple always in like the rule of third, right? Because I want them there or, you know, I don't want them dead center because that's just kind of, you know... Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with it, it's just composition-wise, typically you want things in rule of thirds. I can have my AF point set on the rule of thirds point so that when the couple touches this box, either of them, then 
at that point, my subject detection enables and that takes over for that point. But if say I'm using just face and eye and that person turns more than 45 degrees away from the camera, well, face and eye disables at that point. Face and eye in our camera is literally just face and eye. Human detection is the one that will do face, eye, head, body, the whole, the whole thing. This allows me that if subject detection is lost on the subject that I'm trying to photograph, it now reverts to utilizing this point to tell the autofocusing system where to actually be focusing. In the full 225 area, like the full blown, you know, kind of, it, it, not 225, it's 779 in the um, S5 Mark II and the Mark IIx. But if I'm using the full area, that has no indication from you as an input as if subject detection is not being used, where does it focus? So kind of keep that in mind with, with how this kind of whole thing is, is kind of set up with our camera. Um, you always have the options here to kind of move these. And as I said, you also have the option to use the various subject detections within each of these. Um, for a little bit of definition here, one area is a very specific one tiny area. One area plus gives you a little bit of a buffer outside of that area. So if you think of this as the old school tracking way, where if you have a, a focus point, it'll use the area around those focus points to also help the system. So if you can't keep that box specifically on your subject, it still helps keep it within, you know, the, the, the path that it needs to. But then zone area, very traditional, just zone area autofocusing. Um, you give it a zone. When you select this, you have the box and area that you work with. Same principles. Anything that touches the zone is what will activate subject detection. So as I said, you, you have the option here to use subject detection with any of these choices. Um, when you go into the system, it's as simple as clicking the, the rear AF mode button, which we showed, and then just pressing up on the direction pad to turn subject detection on. And then you can always just press display, which will allow you to come in and say, do I want human, face and eye, or animal and human. Um, each of these are going to be determined based off what you want to use for the particular scene. Um, I saw a whole bunch of questions come in, so let me take a break from that real quick and just run through here and double check on some of these questions here. Uh, Kudo says, Sean, do you remember what power bank you had on the S5 at NAB, uh, S5 Mark II at NAB? It was small and compact. Um, if there were a couple being used, this was one of this is one of the main ones we use. This is from Anchor. Uh, this is a it's so beat up now. This is the 26800, 26800 uh, model. Um, this is what's listed on our compatibility uh, charts online because it supports USB PD. Um, this one is awesome, can fit in, I know Small Rig makes the little like phone holder that people use for like the SSDs and all that stuff. This fits in that, but this is a little bit bigger. Um, other options that we've used are the FX Lion Nano 1, the 58 uh, watt hour one. I think it's 58 watt hour. And then we've also used one of the really small anchor like um, 1000 series. They're like the little tiny ones that are about this big. Um, we've used those as well. As long as it shows USB PD as a support, it's fine. There are select anchor battery banks that their IQ3 system is also validated for our, our setup. The IQ3 system though just takes a couple extra seconds when you first plug it in for the system to configure and then start delivering power over USB to the camera. Um, let's see here. Um, e says, I just bought an S5 2X and just curious to know, will Panasonic's S5 II autofocus ever be able to match Sony and Canon because hardware is there? Um, truthfully, uh, I argue that our system is more advanced in various different areas. Um, there are areas where we excel where they fall short and there are areas where they excel and we fall short. Uh, autofocus systems across the board are... I would argue to the point where 
if you can't get a shot with the autofocusing systems that are now being deployed, um, the new PDAF systems, um, a lot of times it's more coming down to experience with the various cameras versus necessarily one being better than the other. Um, we take a lot of pride in that our system has been, it's, it's, it's a light year jump ahead of where we've been in the past. Um, and there was a lot of attention given to very specific areas uh, where when I've done side-by-side -side testing with all of our competition on these, I can point out probably five or six areas where we are infinitely better than the rest of them. When you actually take a lot of the rhetoric out of the, out of the conversation and test them side-by-side. Um, so yeah, I, I would say we match in some areas and some areas they're better still, but that's just par for the course in this world. Um, no one has a perfect autofocus system. I don't care what anyone says about the competition. They're not perfect. Um, I've seen plenty of videos online where they're focusing pumps way worse than our DFD ever did. And Yet DFD is the one that gets all the flack for it. So, uh, follow up there was from Composite Media Multimedia says any AI autofocusing similar to Sony coming up. Um, I want to I want to address this one actually head on because this is about autofocus here. No camera uses AI autofocusing. AI autofocusing is a system used to help train the autofocus systems and cameras. Um, in order for a camera to actually have AI, it would have to have access to a supercomputer all the time. What is being done in these cameras is the engineers, the software engineers, the AI programming engineers, teams that are using AI, so using a, the ability to program data sets for what subjects look like, um, how defined those models can be, those teams are writing machine learning and what we call deep learning. We've called it deep learning since I think it was the G9 was the first camera that we launched this stuff in. Well before our competition was doing this, mind you. These, op these data sets are used and programmed into the cameras to define what subjects look like. So to say, are we going to have any AI autofocus like what our competition's doing is a falsehood in the fact that one, we were doing it before most of them were, and two, we already have the same things that they have. Eye, face, body, animal detection, you know, stuff like that. The important thing to remember with subject detections in cameras is that subject detection options within all of these setups are programmed. So you can always add and change and, you know, alter the way things are, which by way would mean improve them over time by having the engineering teams that rewrite or refine algorithms. We've been doing subject detections all the way back since I believe it was the G9 was the camera that we launched human detection in. So that was back in 2018, I believe, right around that point. So it's, it's that as we've been building, we have been updating all of that stuff ever since we first released it. And every iteration has always gotten better. And subject detection is done on the contrast side of an autofocusing system, not the phased side of the system. Phase detect is only determining distance. So your subject detection tells the phase system which pixels to use to then go to that point. From there, it's all down to what is decided for speed and accuracy and stuff like that. It's really just a matter of, of how much data you can put into it. So I... I I will stand up hard behind our engineers for the work that they've been doing because they've been doing it for longer than I think most in the industry. And a lot of things, when it comes to say like face and eye detection in the cameras, a lot of times it gets misconstrued that we don't have the same capabilities as the others because our UI looks different. Our UI being the crosshair over the eye with the box on the face, it's just a UI. 
whether it's a box over the eye or a crosshair, it's telling you the same thing and it's using the same data set. So um, I encourage you to, if you've never used our systems or if you've used some of the other systems, the biggest thing that really comes into play between looking at the two is the comfort level you have with the two various systems. If you were to cold turkey take both of the cameras, sometimes you're going to be more comfortable shooting with one style versus the other, but ultimately they're doing the same thing. So yeah, just kind of play around with the stuff there a little bit. Um, now I'm going to step down off my high horse here a little bit. Um, let's see here. I don't understand the GH6 uh, AF in slow motion. It sometimes does better than PDAF, uh, mild exaggeration, and sometimes it's pulsing like crazy. Any tips for consistency? Um, in the DFD system, uh, so the GH6 and back, basically, um, the DFD system is more dependent on frame rate to a point than a PDAF system is. So when you start going into some of the slow motion recording, if you're using 60p as your base, the system is functioning as if it's on 60p and you're just over cranking the sensor. If you have the system on 24 frames per second as your output, it's going to function as if it's recording in 24 frames per second for the focus calculations. So that could be where you're seeing some of the differences there, Damien. Um, 60p, if, if you pick a frame rate on the GH6, faster frame rates are going to perform better up to a point. When you get to things like 120, 240, or 300 frames per second, that's where the systems um, change a little bit because now you're also fighting light gathering because faster frame rates, shorter duration on the sensor. Um, there's going to be little differences there. Typically, when it comes to really fast slow motion work, I am almost exclusively doing it in manual focus. Not because I don't think or trust that an autofocus system could do it. It's more that I prefer the, the focus feel I can get out of manually focusing as opposed to letting an autofocus system rack its focus. Um, if I'm doing slow-mo... I want to be a little more deliberate in how fast or slow I want my focus pull to be, knowing that slow motion one is going to smooth out focus pulls anyway. So a lot of times it's just going to come down to use case. Having the autofocus is great, especially in like the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X, but sometimes a more deliberate hand over letting a system decide where it wants to go or how fast or slow it wants to get to that point can just make things a little bit easier on you and get you better results in the end because you're controlling how you want it to look in the end. So hopefully that helps. Uh, what's your take on using false color LUT um, plus uh, native false color when... Um, false color LUTs are definitely interesting. Um, I think they're, they, they can be useful. Um, so like super cool. Uh, I know Nick Driftwood has created a couple of them and, and I think they're, they're an awesome choice for those. Um, just remember to not record the footage. If you're on an S5 Mark II or a Mark II X, just remember to not be using real time LUT with that function because that will burn that look into the footage. Um, you want to make sure you're using those on the view assists. Um, native false color that's a much harder conversation because there's varying different versions of it and different implementations have been done from various different companies, some better, some worse. Um, I don't know if our system in the Lumix side is going to get it, but know that Matt Fraser and I have pushed very hard along with, I know, a number of other people um, to get false colors in the camera. So, um, Ed says, respecting that, uh, respecting that this is possibly in the realm of what you can't disclose and that is fair, let me instead suggest expanding the list of anamorphic formats as lenses have gotten cheaper. Very true. Uh, anamorphic, uh, recording formats have definitely become a lot, uh, a lot easier to attain these days. So, um, yeah, potentially if you see, uh, or have recommendations of things that you'd like to see as far as, uh, options for anamorphic recording, let us know in the comments after the video. Cause that kind of stuff is great to let the engineers know. Uh, what about autofocus for small birds? 
Um, so that's a perfect segue to get back into this here. So when it comes to, uh, photographing small birds and, uh, realistically any kind of smaller animal, there's a couple things that you can, you can do to help increase your, your hit rate. Um, first off, do not use tracking or full area. That is my recommendation. Um, I, 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 I do not recommend using full area or the tracking mode when you're doing animal detection of smaller objects. The reason being is that your control isn't as granular as you would need it to be. Um, the subject detection box for tracking is huge and you can't really change the size of this. So that gives you a little bit of a kind of challenge with if it's a real small bird and it's within trees, this is a little hard. Um, the other thing is that the full area, again, I find it a little bit more challenging for uh, like smaller animals and birds to, to pick them up when they're nesting within trees. Um, the system is still great, especially because I, I've done a decent amount of shooting like this and it's been, it's been great, but I recommend using two other modes for this primarily because I have found that it, that it majorly increases my hit rate. The first one is zone. So using the zone detection area, um, okay, just as a point, if you are going to spam the spam uh, singular chat message, I am going to be putting you in timeout. So please be cautious. Do not be spamming. Even if it's the same commentary, please do not be spamming the same comment over and over again. Um, zone autofocusing. So zone allows me to actually change the size of this a bit so I can go to a little bit wider, a mid, and then a really small zone. This can help with allowing you to kind of, unlike the tracking mode where it's going to also be looking for a, a visual piece to track, this takes that part out and it solely will use either the detection mode that you have assigned or just the 779 if you're in the S5 Mark II or the Mark IIx. Um, plus it's size controllable. So you can try to get this down to a small enough point. The other option that I recommend is using one area plus one area plus, because this can be sized, um, allows you to be a little more precise with where you want the system to be focusing. Just like I said before with group photos and group video gives you a little more precise, uh, control over, um, you know, what region you want the camera to focus in. And my biggest kind of reason for this with smaller birds and animals is that even if subject detection isn't recognizing that animal, because maybe they move into a position where it's not part of the, the subject catalog, you're now defaulting on a point that you are telling the camera where the focus should go. Um, my hit rates have gone up greatly when I'm in situations with motorcycles in this case. If I've got a number of, of motorcycles in a row and I'm trying to track, I will typically have it set on this particular mode because if I want to be moving from one bike to another, the full area and zone typically ends up being too wide and all of the subjects show up as boxes because they're people on the motorcycles. But when I go into this particular mode, I can be more selective in a group as to where I want it to go. So hopefully this is something that can help you with, you know, the smaller birds, things like that. Trying to keep your, your focus point small while using subject detection as the support tool for it. Um, and, and hopefully it just, you know, as I said, helps you get a little bit better shots out of um, what you're looking for. Um... Uh, DJ says, reminder about the post I made two months ago, please give us UI enhancements for AF boxes, their colors and thickness. It has definitely been passed up, um, to the team though. So, um, is it possible to introduce an option to change the crosshair IAF to a small box so that there is less obstructions over the subject? Thanks for all your help. Um, I have presented that, um, to our team, funny enough. Um, I would love to see a choice in our system for that, whether you like the traditional way of the 
box over the face with a crosshair, or if you want to go to the alternative way with just a box over the eye, um, I would love to see that be added into the cameras. I don't know if it will, and if it if it can be done, when would it be done? But we've definitely brought it up. Uh, Dave says, what are the best AF settings for the S5 Mark II for taking headshots and showing objects to the camera like you do? I've had the AF go out of focus and uh, not refocus uh, again a few times. So for this setup that I'm using right now, I have human detection turned on. Um, so it's human detection with face and eye. And yeah, it just kind of works the way I need it. If I want to present something to screen, like if I just come up and want to present something to screen, it does it. When I pull the camera, the thing away from my face, it does it. Um, the most important thing is probably just going to be making sure that your lenses are all up to date, your camera's up to date. Um, but as a segue, this is where I also come in and play around with a couple of the different settings for our autofocusing system here. Um, so as we had said, you have... You have your subject detection choices in the camera, which in the S5 Mark II, the S5 Mark II X, the GH6, are human, face and eye, or human and animal. But you also have extended control, whether you're in photo or video, for the way that the focusing system responds to your various different inputs. That's called AF Custom Settings. In this case, set up for video. We'll talk about the photo one in a minute. What this option allows me to do is change things like speed, sensitivity, and kind of tune it for how I want my system to, you know, kind of function. By default in your camera, you'll see that these options will be set to zero, zero. Um, and this system is actually turned off by default. But what this allows me to do specifically for video is tweak the speed at which the system runs. So if I click display on any of these options here, you'll see that I have a little bit of a readout here that gives me some information. Adjusting focus speed slow to the negative side. Um, it's designed to more smoothly move the focus through the range. So it's not like a snap to focus. It's more of a smooth, you know, pull into focus. Um, as it describes, it's a more seamless rack focus where if I come in and I go to sensitivity, sensitivity is going to basically tell the system, how long do you want me to hold on the subject where I'm at or the focus point that I'm at before I decide to move my focus point? This is where with things like product presentations to camera, this is where you may want to play with this because it may depend on what your particular way that you want to work with is. Um, locked on, so moving it negative, means that it's going to wait longer before it decides to make the change for focus. Moving to the plus means that it's going to be more jumpy to the second you want to make it move, it's going to jump focus. The thing to remember about this and if you go through a ton of videos online, you can see a lot of YouTubers, this is a, um, YouTubers is in like video game streamers and stuff like that. This is something very common to see with, with their typical face cam footage. Um, a lot of people love doing the bokeh lights in the background. Obviously YouTube has the style and even I mimic it from, you know, what I see online. But a lot of times what you'll see is that a lot of us move. A lot of people that are on YouTube, they move a lot. So they may be joking, backing up, back and forth. And you see how our system, when I move, the focus is kind of, it's it's more like it's blooming behind me instead of like a really like jerky jump in and out of focus. That is what can happen if you set the system up too fast because it's taking every single input that you make and recalculating that it needs to move focus. So you can run into a PDAF system that actually pulses worse than what people had given DFD and contrast systems uh, grief for. Um, 
the difference is is that in PDAF, especially in full frame, it can be way more noticeable because as you move, it it's a much shallower depth of field. But in the way, like I have my setup done right here, you'll see that I can do present to camera. So just our nine millimeter here. And you'll see that even as I'm holding it, it's not actually really jerking the focus around too much. Now, if I move this a lot, you can see that it's, it's moving because it's detecting that I am moving the object in and out. So you can see that right here. The difference with our system is that we have purposely kind of tuned our system to maybe not be the fastest to move point to point, but to do it in a much smoother way so that you kind of get rid of the jerkiness that you see as um, Gitfo pointed out. Um, not saying that one is better than the other. There are times where you may want the system to be much more responsive and you're not really worried about the jerkiness in and out. If you're doing a shot where it's, you know, especially on a tripod where it's move from point A to point B, yeah, you th that could be very useful because you want it to be like this and just snap right into focus. But that's why we give these controls in the camera. Being able to come in and say like, hey, I want it to be ultra responsive and I want it to move really fast is the setting that's going to get this thing to basically snap to those different focus points. The trade-off being is that any movement that's in the subject, even a slight movement, the camera is now saying, I need to recalculate and move focus. So keep that in mind when you start kind of going through this. Um, out of the box, the systems uh, from pretty much everybody are always designed more on the average everyday use case, not necessarily specialized use cases. So for things like this, for product presentation, for talking heads kind of conversation, out of the box typically is good enough, but if you want it to be able to focus up on something like this faster than that slower rack, that's where you would tune your speed up a little bit. But remember that you will potentially have that negative of a little bit more jerkiness in the background. Way more apparent in super shallow depth of fields. Now, AF Customs uh, speed settings here are also active when it comes to photography. Now, the difference with this is that if you look in the video side, you see that we have AF speed and AF sensitivity. These are the two options you have for changing the way the autofocusing system works. But if I go into the, pho the photography mode here, and then I change this to continuous, because I didn't have it set to continuous before, you'll see that I have a different way of doing this in photography. I have various different sets available. So if I reset these, because I've been playing with them a lot. So set one is how the camera is going to come out of the box for a photography perspective. This means AF sensitivity is going to be kind of neutral, switching sensitivity is neutral, but motion subject prediction is a little more juiced. It's a little more pushed. And in each of these, you have the ability to come in and press the display button and it will tell you what this does. So something to note is switching sensitivity. So AF switching sensitivity is operated when using full area AF. So as a reminder, full area AF is this option over here. The reason this one becomes important is if you are ever running into a situation where the system seems to be wanting to jump focus points when you're not giving it an input because you've got multiple people in frame and they happen to be kind of crossing each other a lot or they're standing side by side with each other. This is the selection that you would come in to kind of change that. Lock on means that it's going to try to stay on the subject that you have started the recording with. That is in the yellow part of the box. And that you can come in and actually tune that into various different levels. You want it locked on more, you want it more responsive. Um, so you can definitely play with these and see which one kind of maybe holds the subject better than the other. Or you can go to the other way, like what I described earlier, which is using one area, one area plus or zone, where you are telling it where you want detection modes to be running. The last one in this selection here is mo uh, moving subject prediction. This is 
really comes in more to play with faster moving subjects. Motion subject prediction is something we've been doing for quite a while now, and this is where it takes the information of how the subject is moving across the, the frame, towards the frame, away from the camera, you name it, and it's creating a model to predict the trajectory of that subject, of that point that you're using for focus. So if, say, I, I use uh, motorcycles a lot as an example. There's a road where I photograph on where the bikes come in towards me at about a 45-ish degree angle. They then swoop in front of me and then they exit at about a 30 degree angle away from me. So subject, uh, moving subject prediction, when I tune that, because I can change the level of how, how much I want this to be looking for, because that subject is going to be moving and arcing a little more, you know, kind of not necessarily in a straight line, I can come in and actually come, you know, tell this system, hey, I need you to be more responsive. I need you to be less responsive in how basically how far out the system looks to kind of tell where where it, it thinks it should be moving its focus point. Again, this is if you're using the full area kind of option. If you're using zone and one area, one area plus, most of these options, it's really just AF sensitivity is the one that is core to change because you are telling the point where it goes. You don't need the system predicting where the motion goes. You don't need it predicting how quick to change the subject because you are pointing the camera at the subject that you want the sensitivity is the thing that you want it to really kind of hinge on. When I put the box over a subject, how fast do I want the system to respond versus when it's picking the subjects, how fast do I want it to change or recalculate what subject you want it to go on? So all of these controls are built into the S5 Mark II, the S5 Mark IIx, and the GH6. Um, as I said, by default in photography, set one is how they come out of the box. Set two, we've really kind of tried to clear, uh, clarify the descriptions here. So like set two is if, if you're photographing subjects that move in a constant direction. So we use trains, airplanes, uh, kind of cars, where it's a, it's a known direction and path. Just switch your camera over to set two. Um, if you're a sports photographer where movement is a little more erratic, um, but you also may have a bunch of other subjects in the scene, this is where set three can come into play, and we use football and basketball as an example. And then for my number one use case is set four with motorcycles. Because in this case, this is where your subject accelerates really fast or decelerates really fast, so speed is changing a lot. So it needs to be able to have a more variable setup for motion subject prediction, and your switching sensitivity needs to be a little bit faster. Um, this is this is kind of the core of what I meant earlier when I was saying when once you actually understand you start playing with the various tools within the camera, I will easily say that our system is comparable to pretty much anything out there right now when you're on the PDAF system with our cameras. On the GH6 and the DFD systems, these tools are what can help you tweak the system to really kind of adjust it to your particular style of shooting. If you're doing more talking heads level stuff, this is where you'll probably want to turn things like AF speed down, actually. And you want it to stay more on subject. So you don't want it to be recalculating, uh, you know, the, the focus subject change. If you are in a faster environment, this is where you would speed up the AF speed and the sensitivity uh, in the video side. In the photography side, it's going to be very similar to what you get on a PDAF system. The difference is really just going to be the preview in the display, um, what you're seeing in the viewfinder. Uh, the DFD systems are a little more twitchy than the PDAF systems. PDAF systems tend to be a little bit smoother in that the preview image in the viewfinder. But capture rates and acceptable, you know, what you've actually captured in the image versus what you may look at in the screen um, while you're capturing it are very high in the DFD system that we have. Whether you're on, 
you know, GH series or S series. Um, it's all just about using the camera and setting it up the way that you want it to work. Um, so that being said, if you are coming from some of our, co our competitors' cameras here and you want to get a relatively comfortable system to set up that is relatively familiar for you, if you're in the photography side and you're someone that uses face and eye detection or people detection in some of the other cameras, this is where I recommend setting the camera up in one area plus going in to detect subjects and setting it as human. This, with the ability to set the camera, if I went to the right one, that would be useful. This, while being able to also say, hey, I want to maybe use a wider spot or a smaller spot, and then have subject detection activate on that particular box, can be maybe a little more familiar to some people. If you are doing wildlife and birding photography and it's like bird and flight or it's just larger animals, this is where the zone AF system, I, I think, works pretty well. Um, you have those three levels of control as to how big of a zone you want to use. And in that case, that's where you would be using uh, in the subject detection animal and human. Uh, just remember that animal and human, they are paired in this camera, so it means that human humans will also be detected alongside, you know, uh, four-legged animals and birds and fish, I think, can be detected sometimes, so can snakes, things like that. Um, so you have the various different, different uh, kind of tools there. It is primarily in the video space. Um, like this particular style of setup that I would recommend full area with human detection. Um, as I said, my setup here is the S5 Mark II with full area human detection, and we've changed to broadcast in 4K 30p now. Um, and this is what allows me to do, you know, pretty much everything I need. I can move around. I don't have to necessarily stare at the camera. I can look away from the camera and the focus stays because when it loses my face and eyes, it goes to head. When it loses my head, it goes to body. If I were to set this camera up, go into the display options, help if I actually selected the right thing here, um, go into these. If I am to select face and eye, so the actual dedicated face and eye option here, this is where there is a little bit of a confusion about how we name everything. Face and eye on our camera is literally just face and eye. It will disregard the human head, the, the torso, the body, um, and only activate and only track when eyes, nose, and mouth are detected. Um, if you're used to coming from what is considered face and eye and other brands out there, that is our human detection. Our human detection includes all of it, so just keep that in mind. Uh, let's take... Uh, uh, Ed, thank you for, for the gentle reminder. That is perfect. Um, I do want to address this one. So uh, the question from Ed was about being able to reassign the top dials on the camera, so the front and rear com uh, control dials here, um, on the S5 Mark II, or uh, honestly, actually, in a lot of our cameras. Um, this is actually done through the uh, gear setting here, and you'll see that you have this dial set option here. So dial set here allows me to say, what do I want my um, shutter speed and aperture control set up here? You'll see that as I kind of go through here, I can. these are set to either program, aperture, shutter speed, and in, in manual, it sets it up. Um, you have various different settings here on the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X to say if I am, say, in aperture priority, or actually, let's let's start with set four. If I'm in program, I don't want my front dial to do anything. I want my rear dial to do program shift, aperture change, shutter change in, in those various priorities, and then in manual, I want uh, aperture and shutter between those two dials. But... Say I want to change some of these things up. You have um, dial operation switch. 
this is where I can come in and I can say what I want that front dial to do when I engage the dial operation change here. So it's not everything in the camera. So by default, it is, I believe, set for white balance and ISO. But you access that by going into function button set in record mode. And then say I want to change my, let's change FN1. Um, I want to change this to the dial uh, operation uh, settings here. This is where I come in and I would assign dial operation switch to one of my function buttons. So that now when I press that button, those dials, you'll see on the bottom, the bottom right of the screen. When I press that button, my front dial now controls my white balance change and my rear control now controls my ISO. When I press that button again, it goes back to aperture and shutter speed depending on how you've got it set up. So just as a uh, refresher on that, go to FN button set, record, program one of your custom function buttons to this option here called dial operation switch. Go back out, scroll down to dial set, then go to dial operation switch setup. This is where you can then program in each of these two dials in their alternate mode for changing a couple of different settings. Again, it's not every setting on the camera, but there's a number of settings there that can be controlled by a dial because it's not just like an on or off, it's cycling through some things. So hopefully that helped, Ed. Um, hopefully that was what you were looking for um, to kind of get an answer for it. Um, JC, uh, what Lumix camera are you using right now for the stream? And when you use the BGH1, BS1H, uh, for the streams, what were your settings? Uh, so this is S5 Mark II. When I was using the box cameras for streaming, um, for those that don't know, these are the box cameras. Um, when I was using these cameras for the streaming, um, this was set to full area. Typically, we were broadcasting in 30 or 60 frames per second, and it was face and eye. Not really much different than how I do it here. Um, this is kind of an environment where I never had problems with any of that stuff, even if, if I moved a lot. Um, never got any comments between the various different cameras that I used. So... Um, uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, what about Sam Yang L-mount lenses? Is this coming or not? I, you'd have to ask Sam Yang on that. Um, we don't, we don't have any insight on any of the other L-mount members, uh, plans for products or release or development. Um, all we are is part of the L-mount alliance, which means that we share lens mount information um, it's all built on a standard so things like lens profiles for uh, distortion correction um, uh, information needed to support our systems and others are all carried along that that uh, system uh, ultimately any questions for any individual company within the Alman Alliance does have to be directed directly to that company so yeah. Uh, what do you recommend for product and objects? Uh, example, uh, sliding in a product but want to use autofocus. What AF mode do you recommend? Uh, Kudo, I 100% for something like that recommend using uh, one area plus or zone. Uh, specifically because if you're going to be moving something into frame, um, when you are telling the camera what point you want it to be in, uh, typically like if it's if it's a product photography type shot or a product video shot, usually you might be marking out where you want it to go because the camera's gonna be stationary or even if the camera's not stationary, if you're moving it, it's the same thing. Um, you can set it so that as you're basically moving the subject into that frame, it's gonna follow it. 
Um, if it's coming out of frame and into frame, that's where I use the kind of the one area plus so that it's focused, say, on the table. And then when a subject comes in, then it refocuses onto the object. If it's moving from back to front, that's where you could always use the tracking mode, which is here. Um, tracking modes are okay. Um, they're a bit archaic compared to subject detection, but no one does object detection yet. So, yeah, it's going to be a little hit or miss with some of that stuff. Um, yeah, that's what I'd recommend. Uh, is pre-shoot in the cards... Uh, both for photo and video. Uh, how significant do you think that feature is? Been hearing wildlife people wanting it more. Um, so I think you mean pre-burst, uh, like what we had on the G9. Um, pre-burst, it's... It's definitely not something that we're... We're not... Like, still working on. Um, pre-burst, when we first released it in a camera... Um, like I said, which is the G9, um, that camera does 20 frames per second in the SH burst mode, and then it had, I think, about a half second uh, buffer that would pre-roll pre images for stills. Um, and then it was kind of like a much more advanced version of 4K, 6K photo because you were able to get RAW and JPEGs out of it. Um in the newer cameras, we don't have those modes anymore. We don't use 4K photo, 6K photo in these cameras anymore. So a pre-burst function is effectively gone at this point. Um, but I know, like, I would love to see us add that into cameras moving forward. I just know that the new engine, uh, certain things that were easy to do on the older uh, processors that we used before we moved to the L-squared engine, uh, certain things do have taken longer uh, to kind of program over to the new architecture. Um, cause as we said, this engine is a totally ground up new design. Um, so certain things like live view composite, we launched the S five early with, um, live view composite. It's been a feature that we've had for quite some time, but it took a little bit more time to get done on the new engine to get it into the S five Mark two and the Mark two X. So, um, I wouldn't say it's out of the cards for pre-burst, but I don't know if and when we would have a camera that would have it added or if it could be added firmware updated to the S5 Mark II or the Mark II X. Uh, I can take a couple more questions and then we will wrap it for today. Um, tellings, uh, GH6 and timecode. You mentioned that we could link multiple cameras. How do you do that? We film weddings, four GH6s starting and stopping wreck all throughout the day. Um, this would be gold for us. So... It, in that case, you wouldn't really be able to do it um, in what I was describing because that's more like a studio environment where you're linking cameras through through timecode. Basically, um, you can take your timecode from one camera and, and have it injected onto the other. Um, otherwise, you'd basically have to take the a generator and have it linked to them. Um, yeah, I... Tellings, I, I will do a little more research with Matt Fraser on this, um, who actually, ironically, I will be seeing next week because we will be up in New York at the Build Expo. Um, so a little bit more on that in a minute. Um, and maybe we might be doing a stream from New York. I'm not 100% sure yet. It kind of depends on whether or not I can get a good enough internet signal to do streaming from. So... Um, I will connect with Matt Fraser on this one and kind of uh, try to get you a little more information, uh, a little more recommendations on what to do there. Uh, Ed says, it's perfect. Exactly what you're looking for. Awesome. Great. That's what I love to hear. If, if one person walks away with something that they've learned or that was useful to them, then then I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Um, uh, DJ, do you have any insight of how anyone even get to the Elmount Alliance? Curious. Uh, yeah, go to Elmount.com. Uh, I think it's Elmount.com. Uh, it's Leica's website for the Elmount Alliance. Um, basically, companies can, can submit, uh, I believe. And it has to be approved by, uh, Leica and the committee, I guess, to get in there. But outside of that, that's so far above where I am in the companies that who knows ultimately it's it's down to those that actually you know kind of run the companies so 
Um, not sure if this was asked, but is there any update with shipment of S52Xs? I placed an order August 1st and it's still back ordered. Yeah, um, S52X has been like way more popular than I think anybody anticipated. Um, not really anybody anticipated. I, I kind of had a feeling it was going to be a really liked camera. Um, but I'm biased, so. Uh, cameras are coming. Um, they're, they're basically being sold out as fast as we can make them. Um, especially the X variant of the camera. So if you got your order in, um, depends on the dealer that you're ordering from. I know here in the U S we should be getting inventory in soon. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just been such a fast selling camera for us that, it is legitimately hard to keep them in inventory at all of the dealers across the U.S. here. Um, if you got a an order in with your dealer, maybe give them a call. Kind of see if they can give you an update as to you know where they are in getting them in. Um, not every dealer orders a large quantity of cameras because it's always based on the size of the dealer and you know what they want to what they can carry and bring in versus what we're able to get in to fulfill all the back orders. So. Yeah, um, just just keep in communication with your with your um, uh, dealer of choice that you've ordered it from. So, uh, but like I said, hopefully inventory should be uh, coming in soon. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of a good problem to have that the camera's been selling so well that we just haven't had enough inventory to fulfill. Um, but I also understand the frustration when you've got something on pre-order and you can't get your hands on it at that moment. Um, I do know that there are dealers, at least here in the U S some do have inventory. Um, so yeah. Um, let's see here. It says too popular a product. What a problem to have. Yeah. Right. Um, DJ says wrapping, uh, my time to beg for a new powerful 45 plus mega megapixel to replace your S one R and S five and a G nine and other looming bodies. I have. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I completely understand people want a higher resolution camera. Um, I I would love a higher res camera, but, you know, I, I also really, really enjoy shooting with my S5 Mark II X. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't get to make those decisions yet. So, um, all right, cool. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Hopefully, you learned a little bit about our autofocusing system and maybe some uh, uh, ways to set the system up for yourself. Um, we are going to try to be back live again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, I will be in New York next week, uh, for the B&H Build Expo. Uh, so if you are going to be in New York City next week and attending Build, please come by the Lumix booth. Um, we will be there and, uh, it'll be Matt Fraser, myself, Neil, um, we will be on site. We'll have the cameras there. Stop by, chat us up, check out what we've got going on. Um, I, like I said, I'm going to try to set it up, uh, at least some form of streaming next week, even if it's maybe only for like a 15 minute, just kind of quick stream. Um, pay attention to our social platforms, check YouTube, um, because I will use the post uh, system on here to let everyone know what's going on. Um, if you haven't already check out our Instagram account, our TikTok account, if you're someone who likes to just kind of kill time flipping through TikToks, we've got a couple funny, funny ones up there and some pretty cool, uh, uh, film homages up on that platform as well. Um, and also take a look at Lumix pro services, uh, in the U S uh, we have the red and the platinum level red is free. If you've bought a camera, get yourself registered platinum. If you want to uh, step up into the higher level service. Uh, other than that, um, I think I basically got everything I needed. Yeah. Next week. Yeah. So just, just keep, keep on our, our, our social networks. We'll let everyone know what's going on for next week's stream. And after that, uh, we should be back to a normal schedule of, uh, weekly live on Thursdays at 2 PM. So with that, thank you everybody. I hope you all had an awesome, uh, time here on the stream. Hope you have a great rest of your day and an awesome weekend, and I look forward to uh, coming back to you live real soon. Later.